Monsieur le Président. Mr. President of the Council of State, Your Excellencies, former Mayor of Lampedusa. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is a great privilege for me to be able to welcome you to this uh, exceptional conference, a conference which uh, is part of uh, the human rights uh, cycle, which uh, commemorates uh, five years of, of uh, conferences uh, at the university. And I'd like to say thank you to Mrs. Camille, who is the person who has been uh, running this project for the last five years. It's the week of uh, human rights have led to, to a lot of uh, events. So there was a prize uh, winning or prize awarding ceremony yesterday. And uh, I think some of you may have attended the ceremony yesterday evening. It is a week which will continue with uh, a colloquium which will be devoted to, to migration and in particular to uh, the rights and obligations uh, for states. The Human Rights Week, which uh, is also going to continue with an event which is organized for young people in the canton of uh, Geneva. 400 young people are going to come uh, to the university tomorrow in the auditorium next door, and uh, they're going uh, to see a film. We at the University of Geneva want to uh, really share these experiences uh, with uh, as many people as possible, especially with the younger generation. It is also Human Rights Week, which is going to find its culmination with the Dios Academicus, which is going to be devoted this year to the concept of courage. We've got two exceptional guests, Mr. Litchevich, who is the Nobel Peace Prize, and Mr. Benashua. Both of them, in their respective uh, countries, have uh, dealt with issues relating uh, to uh, human rights, and they have shown an immense uh, level of courage. Mrs. Mayor, you also showed a lot of courage to defend the cause of migrants with the passion that uh, marks you out for a just cause, a cause which perhaps led you to uh, lose your position as mayor of Lampedusa. But I think that is a, a level of courage uh, which we should uh, pay tribute to today. This uh, week of human rights uh, is also being um, addressed by other universities uh, which are committed uh, to this uh, subject. Uh, Universities are multivalent, uh, multifaceted uh, organizations, and uh, that is also why we also need uh, to look at uh, the whole process of migration from different uh, perspectives, from a socioeconomic perspective, from an economic perspective, and all those different perspectives are important if we wish to understand the phenomenon and also to perhaps develop new instruments which will allow us uh, to address uh, what is becoming a more and more urgent uh, problem, particularly in Europe. And it is also something which uh, marks uh, all the political elections uh, which are taking place around us. The University of Geneva has uh, organized a number of events, both here and elsewhere. Here, for example, we have uh, got a, a program which is uh, supported by the Canton of uh, Geneva. And I'd like to thank uh, the President of the Council of State uh, who supports this. And uh, we've been able to welcome 25 refugee students. Uh, and it is uh, a project which allows uh, us uh, to offer an academic uh, program to young refugees and uh, to follow a training program here at the University of Geneva. But we also carry out activities uh, elsewhere. We've got an in-zone program. We have been uh, engaged in this program for the last five years, and it is a program for refugees uh, in uh, Kenya in particular. And uh, there again, we try to provide prospects uh, for refugees who find themselves uh, in uh, refugee camps. We're going to extend this to other countries in the very near future. We also have a, a wish in our university to uh, commit ourselves to other actions. We are part of uh, the Scholaristics uh, Network, which allows us uh, to bring in uh, 
researchers who are threatened in their lives, in their research work. They're prevented uh, from carrying out uh, research work, uh, and uh, that is something that we want to be able to support. And we bring them to Geneva and offer them a possibility to uh, do their research for one year and to continue to develop uh, their career here at the University of Geneva. We will continue that uh, activity in the future. Sorry, I think I have spoken a lot today, so I'm a bit hoarse. We have another program which involves online uh, courses, which are provided free of uh, charge, and anybody can uh, have access to them from wherever they are in the world. Thank you very much for having come so numerous uh, this evening to support uh, the activity which we are developing uh, in the area of migration, and of course also to listen to our speaker this evening. And I'd like to just once again uh, uh, pay tribute to, to her courage. Perhaps Monsieur François Lanchon, who is the President of the Council of State, is going to speak to us first. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very interesting evening. Excellences, Dean, former Mayor of Lampedusa, ladies and gentlemen, professors, representatives of the international organizations, former president of, uh, the, uh, of Switzerland, Mrs. Camille It is an honor for me this evening uh, to speak to you on behalf of uh, the Geneva government and to address a few words to you. Mr. Dean, I just want to point out that our university, uh, as part of uh, the week of uh, human rights which we're organizing, and the presentation this e evening is designed to, to open up people's minds. It is a pleasure also to remind you that it is uh, Geneva, which is the international capital of human rights, the cradle of uh, the Red Cross, uh, and uh, the seat of uh, the UN uh, bodies uh, which are located here, and which welcome you uh, here. Welcome, Miss, uh, Mrs. Mayor of Lampedusa. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who were born out of the Second World War, belonging uh, to a generation uh, whose parents and grandparents uh, didn't know, perhaps, uh, the war themselves, there is still one outstanding question. Would I have been a resistant or would I have been on the side of uh, the perpetrators of violence? I've got a work by Pierre Bayard here, and he tries to address this existential question. Of course, now that uh, we are aware of uh, the abominations of communism and Nazism and what happened uh, to uh, homosexuals, the Jews, uh, the gypsies, the refugees, the camps, the deportations, and the plague of uh, war, and uh, we all have to answer this question 80 years uh, later in a life which is uh, uh, cradled by comfort, would we have been uh, on the side of the resistance? But we all know that only a very small minority were on the resistant uh, on the side of the resistant uh, resistance and perhaps there was also another minority but a small a group and that was the uh, group of torturers but all the rest the majority of uh, people belonged to, to a family which was neither on the side of the resistance nor on the side of the torturers this majority was the majority of what we call indifference, those who preferred to close their eyes, didn't want to know what was going on, didn't act, didn't want to get involved. Indifference alone is uh, what was in the majority, and probably each one of us, if we asked ourselves uh, if we had been uh, either the torturer or uh, the uh, resistant uh, fighter, pr would have to admit probably that he would have been neither the one nor the other, but he would have joined uh, the big wave of uh, the indifferent. Indifference is what perhaps characterizes the situation today. Isn't it uh, true, former mayor of Lampedusa, indifference which characterizes uh, the situation with which uh, uh, Europe looks at what's happening at Lampedusa, the drama of Lampedusa, 6,000 inhabitants and yet uh, hundreds of refugees is, uh, the, uh, uh, is something that has plagued not only Italy but the rest of Europe. Indifference is something that uh, we provide instead of an answer. 
1951, an international convention was signed in Geneva to respect human rights, and the status of a refugee was uh, approved in 1951, and uh, that uh, goes back to an international convention signed here in Geneva. The status of a refugee was uh, established after the war is described as being provisional. The status of refugee is individual. It concerns human beings who are personally threatened because of their actions or because of their political positions, and uh, which uh, is the reason a state uh, would extend protection to using its regalian powers. All our procedures today are inspired by this, even though the world today has changed. Given the situation today, it is no longer possible to deal with uh, demands uh, individually. Otherwise, we would get bogged down uh, by an enormous amount of uh, bureaucracy and uh, everything uh, would be buffeted uh, by the political uh, storms in particular countries. When the status was created in 1951, one million people were concerned uh, by the status around the world. Today... According to UNHCR, we are talking about 60 times more, 60 million people. It's as if each one of uh, the uh, 600 uh, chairs in this hall was occupied by 100,000 people at one and the same time. So you can see that uh, the individual responses are no longer adopted, uh, adapted to the collective challenges of today, and that political or economic uh, refugees uh, will be uh, followed by climate-driven uh, uh, refugees. Today, as I said, indifference reigns, and our responsibility as politicians as citizens remains. That is to remind people of certain basic truths. Geneva is an international city by excellence, which is also the headquarters of the United Nations High Commission of Refugees and the International Organization for Migration, has to respond to that uh, indifference. Uh, the Mer Royaume uh, was an immigrant. The government of Geneva, which I uh, preside over, has seven members who are elected uh, by a majority. Three of them are immigrants uh, of the second generation, and one of them was even a refugee. Geneva is also the capital of Protestantism. In fact, it is part of its DNA. And yet, Protestants uh, today only constitute 10% of a population today, without uh, Geneva having lost that part of its identity. And like many cities uh, that succeed most of our active uh, citizens, that is to say the people who participate in uh, the production of our wealth, come from a foreign country. In fact, that was already the case in the 17th century at the time when the Escalade took place, when uh, the Savoy people attacked the city of Geneva. So this is a historical constant uh, in Geneva. Our collective responsibility has to be found there. We have to fight against rejection. We cannot uh, simply allow ourselves to wallow in indifference. We have uh, to uh, contribute in our own way to the resolution of the collective uh, challenge that faces uh, the world and which is posed by migration. So Lampedusa is probably the uh, um, revealer of uh, the fears of the world. So, former mayor of Lampedusa, we are impatient to hear you here this evening in Geneva. Excellent. Excellencies, President of uh, Council of State, Rector, ladies and gentlemen, this year, in the month of April, Europe woke up with more than 700 deaths, and that was just in one weekend. As of when uh, does the intolerable start, and what is the responsibility of states, governments, and what is our responsibility when we have to deal with such a phenomenon? I have uh, the pleasure and uh, the uh, chance to be able to introduce Mrs. Giusy Nicolini, who is a former mayor of Lampedusa. Giusy Nicolini comes from uh, Lampedusa herself. It is a small island uh, which is 20.2 uh, square kilometers in size with less than 6,000 inhabitants and which is located 200 kilometers south of Sicily, much closer to the island of Malta and Tunisia than it is to Italy. Giuse uh, Nicolini, her real name was Giuseppina Maria Nicolini, uh, 
was committed to politics very uh, young. She became deputy mayor in 23. She became environment minister. Um, she's a, a convinced ecologist. Uh, she fought actively for the protection of the environment on her island, and particularly uh, in order to preserve the wonderful beach of the rabbits. Former director of the local nature reserve, she opposed property speculation, and she always wanted to valorize uh, and uh, pay tribute to, to the heritage of her island. For example, in uh, fighting against a desertification or in favor of preserving uh, sea turtles. She was elected uh, mayor of uh, Lampedusa and Linose in May 2012. In spite of the fact that there were many obstacles on her path, in spite of that, uh, she was subject to uh, many attempts at intimidation. Giusy Nicolini never threw in the towel and she carried out her role with tenacity and a sense of civism. With the, the uh, wave of migrants coming in, whereas others were closing their doors, uh, she uh, showed admirable courage, defending uh, their basic rights. And uh, she was forced uh, to also bury the dead, as well as uh, to welcome the survivors. Do you know that uh, her nickname is The Lion? It's not surprising when you realize that her courageous uh, actions, such as the letters she sent to the European Authorities, six months after election, I quote, I am the new mayor of the islands of Lampedusa and Linosa. On the 3rd of November, uh, I was sent 21 bodies of persons who tried to reach our island. Our cemetery has no longer got any more space. We're going to grow that uh, cemetery. But can you tell me how big the new cemetery will have to be? Or, for example, in October 2013, after the shipwreck of a boat uh, transporting more than 500 persons, she sent a telegram to the uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, the Italian government, and everybody uh, knew this uh, throughout the world. She said, please come and count the dead people with me. She paid a price uh, for her commitment because uh, she wasn't uh, re-elected in June of this year. But Mrs. Nicolini will speak of her experience with migrants much better than I can. She will talk to you about uh, the situation in the Mediterranean, which is the subject of uh, our conference this evening. She welcomed uh, Pope Francis in Lampedusa. She dined with Barack Obama. And her commitment uh, to migrants, her fight for their right to dignity, has brought her a number of prizes. In uh, 2014, she was ranked ninth uh, in the world ranking of uh, the world mayors. She got the world mayor prize. In 2015, the European Citizen Prize uh, was uh, awarded to her by the European Parliament to, to reward uh, the uh, behavior of uh, the inhabitants of uh, Lampedusa after the shipwreck on the 3rd of October 2013, which cost the life of 366 migrants. In 2016, she was given the Simon de Beauvoir Prize for the Freedom of Women, a reward which uh, pays tribute to persons who are fighting for gender equality. And finally, the Félix Houphouet Boigny Prize uh, from UNESCO was uh, awarded to her for uh, her work, as well as uh, given... Uh, at the same time to the NGO SOS Mediterranean. Mrs. Uh, Nicolini will make a presentation and then we will have a discussion with her as well as with the special rapporteur, Mr. Morales. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Nicolini, I'm happy to welcome you and we're looking forward to listening uh, to you. We are impatient uh, to hear you speak. Good evening to you all. Mr. Dean, uh, head of the government, former president of uh, Switzerland, and I'd like also to address my words uh, to younger students, and I am really moved by seeing so many young people in this hall. Thank you very much uh, for having uh, devoted this whole week uh, to human rights issues, and that uh, you're going uh, to discuss uh, human rights uh, throughout the week. I think that this is something uh, which has a sacred uh, uh, nature. And it seems that uh, Europe has lost uh, its memory. It has lost its way uh, when it's uh, being uh, developing uh, the European project. And also, thank you very much uh, for having uh, accepted to come and listen to me telling you about my experience uh, uh, during the five years in which I was uh, mayor of uh, Lampedusa. 
And I'm very moved to, to do that here in Geneva, in a city uh, which uh, uh, really is uh, the cradle of uh, human rights. Lampedusa and uh, Linosa. Perhaps I should show you this. Perhaps I should uh, tell you something about my islands. I'm going to show you a photo few photographs. Uh, these are very small islands, but of great natural beauty. We have uh, 6,000 inhabitants, and they live uh, off uh, fishing and tourism primarily. And geography has uh, dictated uh, that we should be placed right in the middle of the Mediterranean. Do I need to change the slides or does it do it on its own? So as I was saying, uh, geography has decided to place us right in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's halfway uh, between the two continents. And it's basically a bridge between North Africa and Europe. So as I said, it was uh, geography that uh, decided uh, the role that would be played by Lampedusa, not only in terms of its nature, but also in terms of its strategic position along uh, the migratory flows. It really is uh, in the center of the longest migratory uh, flow, which is also, incidentally, the most dangerous of the Mare Nostrum. Geologically speaking, we are part of Africa. In fact, we're still linked uh, to the continental uh, shelf uh, of Africa. And you'll see uh, a lot of uh, animals and veg uh, veg vegetation come from Africa, and you'll find them only in uh, Lampedusa, no other part of Europe. Its natural history and a trace of uh, its uh, early populations uh, show exactly how uh, Lampedusa played uh, a role throughout history. It's always been uh, a nodal point uh, for um, migratory flows. And Lampedusa and other islands have always played this kind of role. Lampedusa didn't suddenly become the epicenter of uh, the migratory crisis. Uh, of uh, the biggest uh, tragedy of our era. That was also the case 20 years ago. That is to say, once the migratory flows were open from the Sahara through Libya, uh, then to the Mediterranean Sea and uh, to reach the Promised Land, the rich, civilized, developed Europe. All the people who've crossed uh, the Mediterranean over the last 20 years have almost all landed in Lampedusa, almost exclusively. So we have been left to our own devices for so long. It is something that's indescribable. It is basically like a life raft. We are a community which has played its role. On behalf of Italy, on behalf of the whole of Europe. And uh, we've been able to overcome our fears and to remain human even when we were worried about our very survival. Not because of a threat of invasion, no. Not because we were afraid of uh, illnesses that were going to be carried to an island, but uh, because of uh, the uh, na narrative used by certain politicians. Uh, an island that was uh, degraded by an invasion of barbarians. That has really damaged our tourism. That has uh, damaged uh, the development of our communities. And it's also um, uh, done a lot to give a fillip uh, to those uh, policies uh, which are aimed at closing uh, the borders of Europe. And people who are left outside, left to die, forced to, to be able to beg for help, uh, to uh, ask for help uh, while they're in the water. And uh, it was all left to small places uh, such as Lampedusa. No lesser person than the Pope has come to Lampedusa. In fact, it was in July 2013. And he broke through this whole barrier of uh, loneliness and indifference. And he said that uh, the drama was not the invasion of migrants, 
we've heard uh, the report uh, by the uh, uh, president of uh, the university. If you look at uh, the numbers of uh, people who uh, uh, been forced uh, to uh, leave their homes for different reasons, war, terrorism, conflict, poverty, uh, change in climate, those are much greater than the few lucky people who are actually able to reach our shores. But the Pope came along and he said uh, that uh, the uh, drama was actually, what was horrendous was all the deaths. I think that Lampedusa has illuminated uh, this drama. And the Pope said, as soon as I realized that uh, under the sea, there are 20,000 uh, dead persons. That was in 2013. That's how many people we expect lost their lives in uh, the sea. He said, I felt as if uh, I was being stabbed in the heart, and that's why I came here. He put the spotlight on the sea. He put the spotlight on Lampedusa and all those places uh, in the Mediterranean all the places uh, that are affected uh, by forced migration. Now, he said he felt a, a stab wound in the heart almost. And uh, he said it was also something that uh, should be uh, uh, really passed on. It was the governments, uh, including the Italian government, uh, that should be given a shake-up. Now, we had a centre-right uh, government uh, which had uh, used uh, the... Uh, and almost like a, a prison. And uh, of course, uh, there are all the politicians who had a responsibility uh, to react. Politicians not only in Italy, but in the rest of Europe as well. In 2011, and we saw in some of uh, the photographs, uh, you saw that uh, this uh, was a boat full of uh, people with layer upon layer of uh, persons, uh, some people uh, traveling in uh, the hull, the poorer people, people who couldn't uh, pay, then also the children who uh, put their heads down uh, for safety reasons to make sure that they weren't going to be carried away by the waves uh, once uh, the sea became a bit rougher. And they're the people who died so easily, died of asphyxia. And uh, at a time uh, before the uh, uh, boats came out to, to save persons, there were a lot of uh, smaller boats that went out to help people and rescue them. In 2011, the uh, island, uh, which I took over as a mayor, uh, had already gone through this shameful period in 2011. It was the Arab Spring. And in February and March, 25,000 Tunisian uh, children tried to leave Tunisia and they managed to reach Lampedusa and the Italian government left all these young people in uh, Lampedusa announcing to the rest of Italy that Lampedusa has managed to stop uh, the invasion. Now we've got 160,000, 180,000 but at the time were just a, a small number, only 25,000 Tunisians. Now, they would have stayed in uh, Lampedusa in order to uh, protect uh, north uh, of Italy. And it was hoped uh, that uh, they would be repatriated from uh, Lampedusa. But that was impossible. It was absurd because you have uh, to repatriate people on an individual basis. And you've got to provide a legal basis to people who are going to be sent back home. And uh, you've got to have agreements with the governments uh, to take uh, their citizens back. Now, there was an agreement with Tunisia, but even now, even today, it is very difficult to, to send uh, Tunisians back home because uh, uh, there are certain limits uh, that uh, will be accepted by Tunisia. And it also depends on uh, the uh, amounts of money that are available from the Italian government uh, to pay for the repatriation of uh, these uh, persons. 
So it was impossible for 25,000 persons uh, to be repatriated in just a few weeks or even a few months. And as uh, the uh, reception centers only had space for 300 persons, you had thousands of young people were being simply kept in conditions such as these, amongst the rubbish, uh, in the cold, and all the public uh, welcome centers were occupied. It was basically just a layer of human flesh. And the covers were provided uh, by the citizens, but often there weren't enough of those covers or blankets. And sometimes uh, they burnt uh, the rubbish in order to uh, get some heat. They emptied uh, the uh, waste in order to cover themselves with the plastic bags. When they were cold, they wanted to be able to put the plastic bags over their bodies. We distributed uh, these uh, waterproof uh, uh, sheets uh, to protect them uh, from uh, the rain, but there were thousands of them and we didn't have enough. These people were um, sleeping under the trucks. They just wanted to have something over their heads. The degradation People were forced to live in these conditions. And I think that a place that uh, welcomes people in these conditions are really offending their own dignity. They are offending our human dignity. In fact, my community managed to, to uh, help uh, these people to feed themselves, to clothe themselves, even though the Italian state was doing nothing. But we couldn't uh, provide a roof uh, to 7,000 and more persons who needed it all at the same time. And then Pope Francis, after the big... Uh, uh, shipwreck in uh, 2013, which I will talk about in a moment, uh, uh, announced the, the launch of the Mare Nostrum uh, project. But that's how uh, Lampedusa came out of its uh, lonely position and started uh, working together with other ports in uh, Sicily, uh, Sardinia, and Puglia, and provided uh, the first uh, reception areas. And that is a very difficult task. You need to make an incredible effort to, to be able to provide health services because uh, these people were arriving, no, not bringing uh, the diseases from their home uh, country, but uh, they are worn down because they were kept uh, prisoners uh, as uh, they uh, moved on in their journey. And also because of uh, the... Uh, uh, conditions in which uh, they traveled, often on these rubber dinghies, suffering from hypothermia, also burns, because of course uh, there was uh, the salt water and uh, the mix of salt water and uh, the fuel that uh, they carried on board, it, in which we needed to refuel uh, the uh, um, engines. They, they often had uh, kidney failure because uh, there was insufficient water on board. They came along with Terrible pathologies. People who were suffering from uh, uh, diabetes, people who died uh, because the people smuggler had uh, thrown uh, the uh, backpack overboard which contained the insulin. Because uh, when these boats are being filled up, at a certain point in time, they decide uh, that uh, they have to reduce the weight in order to be able to ensure the stability of the boat. And what they do before they get rid of uh, people, they get rid of luggage, and sometimes they throw people overboard, and they even kill people in order to be able to reduce the weight of uh, people in the boat. I've heard of uh, uh, younger persons who saw that uh, their parents were being uh, thrown overboard. So that is uh, the situation. That is the current uh, situation. Lapidusa is not uh, the only point of uh, disembarkation in Europe now. 
No, in this slide, what you can see is a reduction in the number of people who've arrived in Lampedusa compared with 2016. And on this slide, you can see that Lampedusa is after Augusta, Catania, Reggio Calabria, and it's in the fifth uh, position, with only 7,000 persons who've arrived in 2017. Seen from the outside, you might uh, think uh, that the fact uh, that we've looked after migrant workers having uh, uh, really done uh, everything to provide help and to share what we had meant uh, that uh, we had to, to neglect uh, the inhabitants of our islands. It's obviously, however, not uh, the case now. We've tried uh, to uh, reduce uh, certain uh, benefits, and uh, that also allowed, of course, uh, the islanders uh, to see that we were also thinking of them. We wanted to show that we were building up a uh, reputation of the island, which is absolutely uh, vital, not only uh, for the beauty of the island, but a place that is beautiful, but uh, which in the public imagination is uh, seen as something that has been invaded and uh, degraded, will not be considered uh, safe or and will not be attractive uh, to tourists. So all the work uh, we did was designed to get um, uh, Lampedusa uh, out of its isolation and to bring the uh, tourists uh, together. And in 2014, 15, 16, in 2016, we had 36% uh, growth in our tourism. So if uh, we are able to overcome a challenge, the challenge posed by survival, having uh, made this incredible effort to, to welcome refugees for 20 years. That is a victory. It doesn't matter if we lost an election or I lost an election, but I won the challenge or I overcame the challenge. I think that that challenge showed us uh, that uh, there are enormous possibilities open to us. There are lots of positive actions that we can take. We can contribute uh, in a way which uh, puts uh, larger areas to shame. I think that we all have a duty to act in this uh, manner, to welcome people. And the possibilities are infinite if a small territory has managed not just not uh, to succumb or to die, then we are an example. And having overcome uh, this uh, solitude or come out of that solitude, uh, we managed to then conquer something else. Even the Sicilians or people from Puglia or other parts of Italy were able to see what we were doing. And I think that they were also aware of uh, the uh, drama and they saw that there were uh, people who arrived alive and people who were dead. And uh, they started to look at human uh, dignity and not just uh, looking at uh, numbers. You know, another 600 people have arrived in uh, Lampedusa. Just numbers upon numbers upon numbers. What does this uh, evoke uh, in people's minds? Masses of people who are invading a territory. And uh, they're not uh, individualized, as if they were not individual persons. Of course, uh, there are macro reasons uh, why uh, uh, there are these mass flows. But there are also individual reasons uh, which lead people to move. And there are also dreams or problems or anxieties and fears. We also saw people who went uh, onto a boat because they wanted to get some cure for a disease. We have helped uh, people, also thanks to the government incidentally, a 13-year-old uh, boy, an Egyptian who was placed on the boat uh, by his family together with uh, the uh, um, clinical um, um, certificate of his seven-year-old brother and uh, he needed to get uh, help for his young brother who needed uh, a bone marrow graft. This uh, young person was helped uh, then in uh, Florence. So the situation is much more complex than uh, people would have us uh, believe. 
And I say this also to uh, or uh, about those persons who are still being classified as economic migrants, people who are not uh, going to be accepted or going to be sent back home. And you can't repatriate people in uh, all countries. And a lot of uh, these people who are meant to be repatriated are simply left to their own devices. What is an economic migrant? What does it mean today? We see that there is new forms of slavery, new forms uh, of poverty, which are aggravated uh, by the fact of desertification, climate change, drought, uh, uh, famine. What does all this mean? What does it mean to, to be an economic migrant? Does it mean he chose or she chose to leave? Yes, there are some people who choose to leave. And there will always be a percentage of people who could stay at home, could stay in their own countries. There are countries, however, where this is not possible and where the wealth is exploited in such an unequal manner. I think that all the people who leave Africa are trying to escape uh, being subjugated and uh, exploited. When we say we want to help them, we've got to understand uh, that uh, we've uh, got to uh, adapt uh, complete to completely new, different uh, policies. Policies based on cooperation, but also uh, policies which prevent the exploitation of people living in those territories. I think that what made Lampedusa so special because of its uh, geography, its uh, location, is the experience uh, that we have had. This is uh, the relocation uh, data. We were meant to have a, a reception center, and it was uh, expected that 27 or 24,000 would be sent back and C-1,000 uh, from Greece. Now, two years... Uh, have gone by and only 9,000 have been uh, resettled from Italy. I think that you can see that uh, all these uh, countries are closing their borders. They're being extremely selfish. They were, these people were meant to go to countries like uh, Poland. Poland was meant to get 200 refugees, only 200 refugees, and they said no. You spoke about courage, but I think uh, there is uh, a bit of fatigue on, uh, on the part of uh, small territories such as uh, Lampedusa or Lesbos. And if you see what's happening in the rest of Europe, other countries have taken in only 9,000. Of all the people who've, uh, uh, who've uh, come off boats since 2015 to the present day. And this is the number of children who have come off uh, the boats starting in 2014 and uh, the figures uh, go up to 2017. Can you can see the number of uh, children who are forced to leave their own homes? It's the families that put them on the boats in many cases. And uh, these are the people who are going to have to remit money and help their families survive. It's with their remittances that uh, they will allow their families uh, to continue to live in their country. This much more than the cooperation policies uh, which are being adopted in Europe. So what has made uh, my people, my island so special? The experience of an encounter and the experience of uh, shared pain and also the experience of death. On my first day as mayor, the day I placed my oath, I was called and the first body uh, arrived. Sometimes I had two, three, four bodies in November when uh, the uh, appeal was launched. It was because 11 seemed to be an insufferable number. 
unmanageable. I, I didn't know where to bury them, nor did I know how I could uh, uh, find a cool storage place until a prefect uh, could find uh, me a cemetery where we could bury the people. The experience of unjust death. You know those uh, special thermal blankets or uh, aluminium foil um, sheets that are placed around people when people uh, arrived. Now, the first uh, bodies uh, were brought in uh, and the... Um, Coaster Guard were bringing uh, people in, were bringing in bodies, were bringing in uh, the information uh, that people had lost uh, their lives. In fact, people had lost their lives three hours before we heard about it. And we just didn't have enough uh, bags. We had uh, bodies of two, three-year-olds, people who were just wrapped up uh, in uh, these thermal blankets. And we were waiting uh, for the... Uh, stretches uh, to come in. Now, I took a photograph of uh, these bags. Three-month-old baby. And all these bodies were being brought in. And it took uh, days and days for the bodies to, to be picked up. the uh, army helped us uh, to take uh, uh, the uh, uh, bodies uh, from the port uh, to uh, the hangars. And we had uh, bodies coming in all, at all times of the day and the night. 366 bodies. Some uh, were fished out at a depth of 50 meters, no less. This procession of dead bodies lasted for days and there was the smell of death which has remained on the island in fact it remained on the island for a month it is something that obviously uh, um, forces you to take sides with uh, people on the side of life i hope that people would arrive alive and when people said, well, yes, there are people disembarking, I was happy people were disembarking and that it wasn't a boat full of uh, dead bodies. This was uh, the welcome center in uh, Lampedusa. It was always uh, overflowing with people. Lampedusa was the only place uh, where they could uh, disembark. We couldn't say to them, you know, there are 800, there are already 1,000, because what do you do with the others? Do we put them back into the sea, or do we leave them to come back onto land? And the welcome center, the reception area, was always full. It was always in a terrible condition. In fact, it wasn't only not a dignified uh, situation, it was inhuman. These mattresses uh, were actually from a rubbish bin, and uh, they were building sort of uh, little uh, huts like animals. This was uh, the Lampedusa Welcome Center. People were sleeping under these conditions. That's why I said, please come and help me uh, count the number of dead. Lampedusa could not be left to its own devices. We simply couldn't sustain that uh, burden. Once you'd saved people from the sea, once you'd seen the conditions in which they arrived, and even the survivors were being kept in uh, these conditions. People who needed health services, they need to be uh, helped not to be left to, to sleep on the ground. We provided health services. We uh, looked, provided help for the family of uh, survivors. 
This was on the 3rd of uh, November 2013. We planted 366 uh, trees in order to commemorate the 366 people who'd lost their lives. We uh, lit candles. Here are the survivors and the family members uh, of the victims. E abbiamo mostrato al mondo le bare. Abbiamo lottato per we fought uh, to get uh, the TV cameras to come along and uh, take these films in the hangar. In fact, originally no authorization had been given them to film, but we knew that the sight of all these coffins, 366 compared to the 20,000 who had already died, and another uh, 20,000 that uh, the Office for Migration has counted from 2014 up to the present day. What do they represent? Not even that many. But for the very first time, they became visible. For the very first time, they became visible to others. E in quelle bare ci sono i bambini, e in una di quelle bare bianche c'è una donna col feto ancora. We can also see a, a woman, we saw a woman who still had her feces attached. She was down in the boat. Of course, we all kneeled in front of those coffins, but nothing changed. If you want to know what our secret was, to find the strength to uh, overcome the suffering. This is the secret. These are the kids. We not only received uh, death people, but also, also kids that were born on the boats and on the patrol boats. And then we discovered that all these, uh, these babies, these babies were actually born out of violence and sexual assaults of police in Libya, of smugglers and criminals that kidnap people along the roads. But then we take them in our arms. This is a girl that had been separated from a, a family. We see and we have fear because of the uh, uh, of the atmosphere, that what happens, of course, there are mass arrivals. We don't know when they arrive. And this, of course, can cause a, a state of emergency. But try to imagine what happens out in the sea when the inflatable raft is sinking and all the patrol units need to be uh, uh, quick to take them on board, even hundreds of people. There are not many people on the patrol boat, so they have to uh, take all the people ab aboard, which are a lot more, and they have to take them offshore and then go back. And in these situations, brothers and sisters are separated, uh, husbands and wives, parents and children. And in these cases, we do uh, everything we can to reunite them. This girl was there, and she was waiting for her mum. This girl was an orphan because her mom died on the patrol boat because of the serious burns that she suffered. We had her in the center for a few days and then she was adopted in Palermo. This is a little boy. They taught me that when they, uh, they are born, all the little children are white. And then overnight, we saw really uh, the color of the skin changing to a darker shade. They called him Femino. And there are so many, so many children, beautiful children, who arrive. And they really pass on their hope to us, the courage. They tell us that their effort is worth it. 
these are dead people that arrived after 2013, 2015. In 2015, 28 people died on board of the patrol boat for hypothermia because of too many waves and they were really uh, fighting for their lives. When they took them on board, they were alive, but then they arrived and they were dead. Many people came to see, even Abramopoulos came to see what was going on in Lampedusa. And I would like to show you also this picture of the museum, of the dialogue and of trust that we inaugurated because we thought it was important to have on this island which lives off tourism and it becomes really a beacon in the Mediterranean. It was important to have a place that would tell the story of migration, the story of Lampedusa, but also the shipwrecks and the pain through artworks. We have worked together with many museums uh, all over the Mediterranean that sent some artworks. I think that the idea of sharing our knowledge and to tell the story of humanity is something that we should always do uh, with a growing effort. But politicians are afraid of uh, what's going on in Europe right now. Also, uh, some parts, we had uh, the Amorino Dormiente of the Caravaggio from Florence to Remember Ireland. That child that moved the whole world. But we had a cry in front of uh, a dead child and then we uh, send away the uh, the ones that are alive. And we showed all the artworks together with some of the objects that the dead people had with them. Uh, books, letters. The President of the Republic came to uh, the inauguration of the museum, uh, of the uh, exhibition. We also showed a car that a five-year-old uh, Children, ch child that died had in its pocket. All this to tell, to say that about 300,000 people were saved because of my islands. These 300,000 people now are somewhere around the world. It's like having 300,000 new Lampedusans. Some of them, of course, sent back money to their countries, but they also contribute to our economies. So uh, I'm really proud uh, of the fact that I uh, contributed to their, uh, to the rescue. There were elections, as you said, in Lampedusa on the 12th of June, and I'm, I'm not the mayor anymore. To me, it had been an honor to be a mayor of Lampedusa. This maybe happened because Lampedusa and Linosa chose to go back to uh, isolation in their little world of local interests, maybe because all this attention sort of put fear in the citizens' minds. Or maybe it is true that it was because I chose to be also the mayor of those new 300,000 people from Lampedusa that we rescued. But for sure, I couldn't have done it any other way. And I'm convinced that the beauty and the, uh, the natural richness of my island and all 
frontier places is also based on humanity of people who live there. A place cannot be just beautiful if it chooses death, if it bases its existence on the refusal of people who want to reach that place to uh, live. A place cannot still keep its beauty if it turns its back on the sea. The sea that from which our civilization was born. Showing the courage of the small regions like Lampedusa, but not only Lampedusa. These regions show acts of peace. Pope Francis launched an appeal to young people, to mayors and to communities, you should build peace. If you live in Lampedusa, what can, what can someone do for peace? Something, the only thing that it's in his power, on her power, which is welcoming migrants and solidarity. Allow me to uh, conclude talking about the, uh, one of the prizes that I received, the uh, Olof Palme. Thirty years ago, he used to say we cannot build walls that separate us from the rest of the wall, walls that mean isolation and regression. Evolution brings human beings together, together with uh, solidarity. We cannot make this a problem, particularly if we, if we keep having irregular migration, illegal migration, because this causes death and suffering for the migrants insecurity, emergency, disorder for the hosting communities. I understand that the island is like a, a raft in the middle of the sea. It's a very little, small territory where all the uh, consequences of uh, policies are felt. And it's easy to understand that the rights should be uh, everyone's rights or nobody's rights. There is a very close relationship between who lives and who wants to reach our shores and have the possibility to have a life. Even Bauman says, we are just one people, we are one planet. It, the obstacle don't matter. We need to know each other and the common knowledge is the only way to peaceful living and solidarity because there are no alternatives. The migration ca uh, crisis according to Bauman, tells us what the destiny, our destiny is. We need to look at Lampedusa and at the, as the experience of this island. And at the basis of all this must be the culture, the, all the welcoming policies, the information. We need to convince people that it's possible to regulate the migratory flaws, that it's possible to ensure legal entries in our countries through tools that are already being used. Uh, the uh, relocation on uh, the arrival, upon arrival and in hosting countries, 
there should be a, the idea of asylum in all reception camps. We should be worried about the camps in Libya at the moment. The agreements that Libya and Italy concluded didn't decrease the number of dead people because they actually increased. In 2016, there was one dead for each 100 people that reached the shores alive. In 2017, one out of every 49. So the decreased, the death decreased because less people arrived. But also the rescue operations decreased. NGOs were sent away. The boats that were there, these organizations that were there where Europe was not, helping Italy that was left alone in this very moment, Italy is in the same condition as Lampedusa has been for 20 years. There are no other solutions. The only way forward is to manage these processes that have been in place for millions of years. And there will always be. We just need to choose how to regulate them. We need to talk, we need to discuss how we should show, we should share the burden of responsibility which cannot only rest on the countries, on the frontiers of the Mediterranean. But we should not forget that there are other countries in Europe that have done more than Italy more than France, more than Eastern Europe, Germany welcomed only 1,350,000 Syrians in 2015, and still is the best performing country for relocation. Germany welcomes more than any other country in Europe, more migrants. We need to do, all needs to do, everybody needs to do its part. Because also the fight against terrorism, the most difficult challenges comparing to uh, receiving migrants will be we receive a help with this because welcoming migrants is a gesture of peace. Thank you. Very difficult to, to uh, speak after such a courageous uh, report uh, that we've heard. 
and also it's very difficult uh, to uh, speak with dignity of a tragedy uh, which has not only struck Lampedusa but has struck the whole of Europe. So thank you very much for your presentation. Before I open uh, the debate up uh, to all the participants, perhaps I should ask Felipe González Morales uh, from UNHCR, who is a special rapporteur of uh, the human rights of immigrants, who is uh, going uh, to give us another perspective. And uh, he's going uh, to look at the political and institutional approach uh, to this issue. Mr. González Morales, the floor is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you can imagine, it's very uh, difficult for me to speak, to speak after the uh, very emotive uh, speech by the former uh, mayor of Lampedusa. Um, I want to uh, thank the University of Geneva for having invited me uh, to participate uh, at this uh, conference, and tomorrow I will give a, a longer speech. Uh, I just uh, assumed the position of a special rapporteur on migrants at the United Nations uh, in August, and this is the first opportunity I have to uh, come to the UN headquarters uh, uh, on, uh, on the matter of human rights in my new position. So I really appreciate the invitation of the University of Geneva in this regard, which has allowed me also to meet many people around here uh, during these days. I will provide you a brief overview of the human rights obligations that states have with regards to border control measurements. Many people are forced to move in order to escape poverty, violence, discrimination, poor governance, or the effects of climate change. The main pool factors for migrants are official or unacknowledged labor needs and family reunification factors that are rarely or properly discussed uh, and focus more on negative public discourse that invokes xenophobia and fear of migrants stealing jobs. Instead of addressing the reasons behind migrations, uh, states' first impulsive reaction usually is to stop migration. Often states respond to increased migration movements by creating and progressively increasing barriers to mobility with a focus on securitization, repression, and deterrence policies. The central objective has been to secure their borders by building fences, using violence to stop undocumented movements across land and sea borders, using long-term detention as a deterrence tool and carrying out collective expulsions to countries of origin and transit, all of which are too often conducted without sufficient assessment of individual protection needs and adequate oversight. Moreover, states have moved their border management activities beyond their territorial borders extending them to the high seas and third countries. So states may determine who has the right to enter the territory, while at the same time being bound by to international obligations. But what does this mean? It means that while states have the power to admit, to deny entry, or to return migrants, they equally have an obligation to respect the human rights of all migrants in the migration process. States also need to respect certain limitations such as the principles of the best interest of the child, family unity, and non refoulement as outlined in the UN Convention Against Torture and the UN Refugee Conventions. Practically speaking, this means that states must increase their search and rescue capacity and refrain from pushbacks at land and sea borders. The militarization of border control creates unnecessary suffering and leads to violations of human rights and humanitarian law at borders. States need to develop procedures, guidelines, or systems for ensuring that search and rescue is implemented as a paramount objective, taking into account what should be done with those who are rescued. Upon arriving and documented uh, in countries of transit or destination, all migrants fall within the category of irregular migrants. Prompt and proper individual screening and assessment procedures are required in order to effectively identify 
their specific vulnerabilities, and determine the legal protection frameworks that meet their needs. The lack of proper individual assessments and of the possibility for migrants to present their claims outlining the risks they may face when returned to their countries of origin creates a potential violation of the international principle of non refoulement Effectively ensuring the proper protection of the human rights of migrants is not possible in the absence of a well-functioning asylum system, system and of adequate and appropriate infrastructure for managing large movements of migrants. Despite legal prohibitions, pushbacks and refoulement to countries of origin and third countries with weak rule of law and poor asylum, poor asylum systems have been improperly conducted and developed out of species of bilateral agreements. It is important to note that the return of migrants who do not meet the required international or national legal standards to remain in their host country must be conducted in safety with regard to dignity and respect for human rights on the basis of the primacy of voluntary returns, cooperation between states of origin and reception, and enhanced reception and reintegration assistance for those who are returned. Mandatory detention on foreign arrival should be abolished. Many rights-based alternatives to detention exist, including registration requirements, the deposit of documents, the payments of bonds or bail on the provision uh, of a surety or guarantor, and so forth. A number of countries have moved towards open reception facilities, in particular for vulnerable migrants such as unaccompanied minors and families. Generally speaking, detention should only be used as a measure of last resort and only allowed for the shortest appropriate period of time. Member states should ensure that alternatives to detention are available in law and implemented in practice. Families with children and unaccompanied children should not be detained purely because of their administrative immigration status. The detention of children, even for short periods, can have severe psychological consequences for their development. The Committee on the Rights of the Child and other human rights mechanisms have made it clear that immigration detention can never ever be in the best interest of a child and in the immigration detention of children, whether accompanied or with their families, always constitutes a violation of their rights. Consequently, both unaccompanied migrant children and families with children should always be provided with alternatives to attention. Finally, the widespread idea that erecting fences and walls to push back migrants over the land or sea border, often under the use of force, or to offer terrible reception, terrible reception conditions, will serve as a deterrence tool is erroneous and counterproductive. It will only increase the suffering of so many and push them further underground. The migrant smuggling market is, in, is a direct consequence of the lack of regular migration channels, particularly for low-skilled migrants and strict migration control. States should recognize the pull factors, such as the unrecognized labor needs, and open up more regular migration channels, including for low-skilled workers. If states want to control their border, they will have to open up more channels for migration, including for low-skilled migrant workers, so that migrants no longer have to use smugglers and venture on perilous journeys. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'd like to thank our two speakers, particularly Mrs. Nicolini, uh, for something that really touched us, and I'm sure that uh, it will probably prompt a lot of questions. And I hope that we'll be able to answer some of them. But before we go into the question and answer session, can I just open this uh, discussion by asking a first question myself? And I think it brings uh, together your two approaches. I think that there is a striking contrast uh, between what the local authorities uh, were doing, the NGOs and 
the various programs that are being implemented, uh, which find themselves uh, very uh, hard put uh, pushed uh, to deal with this uh, micro migratory flow uh, situation. And Mrs. Nicolini, you said uh, that you were left uh, to your own devices, uh, basically. And then you took uh, an initiative in order to try and help uh, the local groups uh, by getting uh, a number of mayors who are affected uh, by migration to work together. Can you tell us something about that? Yes. At the beginning, there were about three of us, uh, and we decided to, to work uh, together. We created a network uh, with uh, the Mrs. Uh, uh, Lau in um, Barcelona, as well as the uh, mayor of Lesbos. And then we extended uh, the contact to, to include others, because the need to be together, to exchange experience, and also to become a source of strength. Uh, because obviously we weren't uh, a strong uh, group uh, coming from a small territory. That uh, need is very, very strong. We needed to get people to understand our needs. Uh, we needed to be able to count on the support of others. And also to be able to help one another in the network. At Alao, uh, the mayor of Barcelona, said, we would like to welcome uh, migrants, but our country doesn't seem to want to open its doors to migrants. We're not being given this possibility. And uh, we are not able to uh, bring in uh, refugees. But we can help uh, those uh, places which are on the border. So we could uh, develop a network. Then we had a first meeting in Lampedusa. And I met uh, fantastic uh, mayors, for example, at uh, the French border, Grand Center. Uh, they did uh, the opposite of what they're doing in Calais. In other words, organizing reception centers. But it's only the degradation that becomes emblematic. And uh, this is what is being shown on televisions all over the place. People then speak about uh, invasion. But rather, we should be talking about the commitment of so many communities, a desire to help. People who are really uh, developing specific positive actions. To the point that I think that even uh, when it comes to climate change discussions, these are things uh, which are major issues, which uh, re require global responses. I believe that we need to become proactive, and we need to get uh, even the small areas uh, to become more proactive. Because the change in uh, our climate, the change in our energy production, these are things uh, that don't take place overnight. You build things up over time. And I believe the same thing uh, with regard to the migratory flows. Lots of uh, different areas, lots of different territories can come together and bring about a change and can also have an impact on the choices of governments. Mr. Morales, how can we promote uh, local governance? To promote local governance at a uh, global level, how to help and support local authorities when they are facing and dealing with such uh, tragic issues. Well, it's working, yes, it's working. Okay. Yes, I, I wanted to, to make a, a short comment about the, the first question as well, um, which is related to the to second one. Um, because a problem I, I see as a general matter is that uh, uh, the response um, on the part of the authorities in many countries uh, depends very much on who is the person in charge. Uh, this example in Lampedusa, I mean, shows the, 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 the very good side of a very good response, uh, but it really was a, a matter of the, the, of the reaction by Mrs. Nicolini. And maybe uh, migrants won't find a person like her in, in many other places. So that's a matter of uh, lack of, of, of planning. Um, I had had in the past the opportunity, for instance, to observe the, similarly the uh, 
increasing migration of uh, children uh, from Central America uh, to the United States, um, and also uh, see firsthand how the, the situation was there, how the reaction took place. I mean, as a general matter, there is a lot of improvisation, I would say, in many of these uh, initiatives. In some cases, the civil society organizations have been able uh, to establish, uh, for instance, some kind of uh, shelters for the uh, uh, migrants in very uh, basic conditions. <clears throat> and these have been, at some point, uh, followed up by the state or institutionalized in a way. Uh, but again, uh, I wouldn't say this is a matter that has to be primarily addressed to provide shelter, for instance, for migrants for civil society, but rather for the states are part of their international duties. So the issue of governance, I, I think, is very much a matter of, uh, of uh, planning on the part of states so that these uh, situations of in increased migration at some point here or there have an adequate response. And the, at the United Nations at this point, there is the ongoing discussion of the Global Compact on Migration, uh, and that is a good opportunity also to uh, recognize some standards uh, for all states. Because that's a part of the problem, that uh, concerning migration, uh, the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on this matter uh, has been ratified for about 50 countries, almost, uh, and these are almost all of them uh, countries of origin. So it doesn't really uh, act as an instrument for all the community, and I expect that the global uh, compact will help to increase the, the to enhance the work on this matter. Thank you so much, Madame, Monsieur. On a désormais la possibilité. We can take a few questions from the audience. So try and be very brief when you ask your question, and perhaps you could introduce yourselves as well. I can't see very much uh, who would like to ask a question because of the brightness of the lamps. Perhaps I'll just stand up because I can't see anybody. Pardon. Dans le première partie, il y a déjà. Oui. Go ahead. I'd like uh, to thank uh, Mrs. Nicolini. I think it really is so moving uh, to listen to you, and thank you for being such an inspiring model. Can you tell us something about uh, the relationships that you've been able to develop with uh, local authorities and the migrants? And is there any differences in uh, the reaction of local people, and how did you manage to deal with that? Yes, now, obviously, uh, you should not imagine that Lampedusa is uh, an unreal, fantastic uh, place. Obviously, there are the good and the bad, even in Lampedusa. But I think that the spirit, the dominant spirit in the community as a sea-based um, community, as a, an island community, was fundamentally welcoming. In 2011, for example, I think you saw this in the pictures, you saw these terrible pictures, but there were families uh, that opened up their homes uh, to some of the refugees, gave, gave them a, a bed, uh, allowed them uh, uh, to take a shower or to get out of the cold. And then There are some people who have uh, developed a very um, close relationships, particularly with the people who saved uh, the uh, survivors. And uh, we see people coming back to the island uh, to uh, re renew their relationships with those that helped them. I think that uh, this also changes people's mentalities. Now, in my presentation, I didn't speak about the actions that we introduced during some of the most uh, dramatic moments in order to provide uh, psychological support uh, to the refugees. Even uh, the people who are providing uh, 
uh, first uh, aid. Uh, there was, a, for example, a fisherman who was amongst uh, the first who provided help. And he fished out the people who were uh, alive, but also some bodies. And it took him six months before he would venture back out onto his boat. Because, uh, of course, he was proud of the work uh, that he'd done, but at the same time, he felt uh, guilty for not having succeeded in uh, helping to save more. And that is why he needed real psychological support. These are experiences which mark you and which lead you to change. But it also brings about cohesion and uh, strong links of solidarity emerge as a result of such actions. If I had to, to summarize this, I'd say that anybody could become a Lampedusan citizen faced with a situation such as this. Thank you. I think that there is a gentleman in the third row. On va vous amener un micro. A microphone is being brought to you. You can answer, ask your questions in Italian. I've got to two questions. I'm a, a, a Sicilian, so I'll ask you a, a question from a Sicilian uh, perspective. And I've uh, spent uh, many uh, seasons in Lampedusa, so I know it uh, by heart. How has your perception of Europe changed over these years? Particularly in the light of all the things that you've seen all the things that you've experienced uh, together with the other citizens, and also this uh, fatigue. Ha ha have you changed? Yes. I think that perceptions do change, and all our perceptions have changed, I would uh, venture to say. I think that we all feel betrayed, including by European policies. It's, you know, Europe, uh, which is meant to be the Europe of values. Uh, we are also living through a period of austerity, which doesn't help. And uh, then there was the challenge of uh, globalization, the major challenges that we are facing uh, as a result of globalization. So it is an unjust Europe also when it uh, comes to, let's say, internal cohesion. But I think that when you realize that people are dying, not because they were killed by uh, the sea, it's not because uh, they were just um, victims of the slave trade, but because there are laws, and the laws say that you are not allowed to, to come into your whatever your reason might be. And uh, therefore, they have to come in uh, in a clandestine manner, and uh, then uh, when they come in and have to beg for help. And uh, these people are often perceived as enemies, therefore. This is something that uh, should be a cause for concern to us all. We want to see uh, growth. We want to see uh, improvement in uh, social networks. Uh, and I think uh, that we need to, to recognize uh, human beings. Uh, now, in Lampedusa, uh, fishermen are saying, what kind of uh, um, Europe do we have uh, when they tell me how big the size of the fishing nets can be? And they're not even interested in saving people's lives. Yes, uh, madam? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Nicolini, I've uh, got uh, a question uh, with regard to what you were saying in 2013 when uh, Pope Francis came to Lampedusa. Can you tell us? How were you able to get a better flow or better management of the migratory flow? I uh, fought to get improvements. 
I made uh, sure that uh, there should be t visits by technical experts uh, to the reception centers and uh, certain standards uh, uh, had to be um, established. For example, we said that in the reception center, maximum number of people should be for 400, not for 800. That allowed us to, to improve conditions. I also asked uh, that if we're going to maintain human, dignified conditions for the refugees, we should uh, allow uh, for quicker transfers of uh, people to secondary reception centers, such as in uh, Sicily. And that should be done in all places of first arrival. Often you cannot plan uh, for the uh, arrivals. They're not regulated after all. And obviously, you're going to find yourselves in situations of overpopulation. So you've got to be able to transfer people out quickly. You've got to get them into these secondary set reception areas so that you've got human dignified conditions uh, which uh, will be offered to the people who are going to arrive. I think it's only when you are in the field that you realize uh, what needs to be done in order to improve things. For example, children, women. These are the people who need to, to be transferred out first. You also realize that it is necessary, for example, uh, to uh, bring in health services. After all, all the women who are coming in uh, have been marked by violence. And they all have a need uh, to be seen by a gynecologist. You know, 20 years of uh, experience and hundreds of uh, uh, being uh, told uh, all these terrifying stories. We were able, as a result, uh, to be able to improve for the services provided to the community. As, you know, people say, well, they're bringing in all these illnesses. Well, if you want to uh, guarantee the health of uh, citizens, but also to the whole of Europe, after all, people are p passing uh, through, obviously you need to have uh, health uh, service uh, teams, you need to have specialists, uh, you've got to uh, uh, also have cultural mediators. Because uh, the way we relate to, to these people uh, is uh, different. Often we need to, to be able to bring the doctors in with cultural mediators alongside them. I believe these are the things that a mayor has to do. And probably this is also the best way in order to be able to uh, look after the citizens. I know that when you're operating in an emergency situation, is uh, difficult. And when you have uh, things like uh, earthquakes uh, and other emergencies uh, will uh, also lead to certain criminal acts. Uh, in uh, the larger reception centers, for example, you know, you will get uh, people taking uh, advantage. Uh, more people who come in, the more you can earn, the more you can take advantage, etc. I think uh, that uh, we have uh, situations that are similar. You know, in other countries, they look uh, at the security aspect, and I'm not sure if it's always a very good idea to close people in. But people are being exploited. And there is a lot of intolerance and a lot of uh, fear. And uh, that is being instrumentalized. It's being instrumentalized uh, by the populists and the right-wing parties, the uh, racists and the xenophobes. All this is generated uh, because of uh, uh, the deterioration of uh, the conditions in which these people are living. I think that we have uh, to get rid of emergency situations. We've got to prevent a deterioration of the situation. And in my view, if we are able to do that, then you will be able to find much more appropriate uh, uh, instruments, S instruments uh, which uh, have uh, to be used to fight against uh, intolerance. Obviously, you've got uh, awareness raising uh, measures, but that takes a much longer period. 
So I think that there is an urgent need uh, to have plans in place uh, to be able to uh, welcome uh, these uh, people and something that is based on the principle of uh, solidarity. I think it is a combat on uh, values in order to be able to bring, uh, develop this uh, counter-narrative, apart from uh, this uh, awareness uh, raising which is needed at the European level. What about in terms of education uh, in Europe? I think we should uh, remind ourselves that uh, Europe is a land of uh, immigration. And uh, we have a need uh, to uh, look at our reception policies. How are we going uh, to build up uh, this counter-narrative uh, when we're up against uh, the fears uh, which lead to these uh, electoral uh, changes? And you've suffered from that uh, directly. How can we build up this counter-narrative? Well... I wanted to, to show you uh, the picture of the museum. Why? Because I think that this is an instrument which is fantastic, uh, which allows you to communicate to, to others uh, and also to uh, the young people in Lampedusa. Memory. Memory is something which has to be cultivated. It has to be built up day after day. I think that uh, Italians have uh, lost uh, the memory of their emigration. You know, there are 63 uh, million Europeans who emigrated to other parts of the world after the Second World War. We don't remember the uh, emigrant uh, who went to, to find uh, work abroad. But we do remember the colonization the fact that we dominated other countries and uh, there is a colonial attitude. I think that it is important to, to keep memories alive and we should do so in all different ways possible. Even a rusted vehicle now there was a little uh, body uh, of a five-year-old boy that fell out of this uh, vehicle. But that is a way of uh, reminding people of this injustice and of uh, the violence in all these places that have uh, been marked uh, by emigration. Switzerland itself is a country which has been marked uh, by migration. A lot of immigrants uh, have come into Switzerland. And I think that uh, what we need to do is to remind people of this to remind uh, countries uh, of what has been the contribution of uh, migrants, how they have created or contributed uh, to the wealth of these countries. Yes, so uh, working on re uh, maintaining uh, the memory alive. Uh, yes, madam, you over there. Senora. I uh, thank you from the bottom of uh, my heart. I would have liked to have gone to Lampedusa and... Uh, I would have liked uh, to that we need these people and uh, that we are aware of our responsibility of uh, the genocide that we perpetrated in Ethiopia and in Eritrea. So I would uh, like to thank you for all that you've done. But let me switch uh, to France. What about uh, a, a person who was uh, sent back after eight, um, eight months? A person who was uh, an asylum seeker, a refugee, and then that person simply disappeared the day before he was due to be sent back uh, from Italy. I have uh, the story of uh, somebody who was uh, in uh, prison for two months in Stanz, and they put him in uh, prison because they were afraid that, that he was going to escape. I'm sorry if I interrupt you. I think that we need to just uh, concentrate on one aspect. Now, the detention of minors is a problem, at least uh, for our legislation it is, and we're trying to get things uh, to change. I 
I think, what about the programs that we need to establish? Now, the Italian parliament has adopted a piece of legislation on minors, probably, which is the most progressive in Europe at the present time. And a lot of associations uh, came uh, together in order to ask for more equitable uh, standards uh, to be adopted uh, by way of legislation. And so it shows you how citizens uh, can become uh, the guardians of minors. And I think uh, that uh, this is uh, something uh, which allows young people to be accompanied or guided uh, by an adult uh, who will help them during their studies. Now, in Italy, as I said, we are very happy. I think that this is one of the most important uh, developments uh, that we have been able to contribute to. Mr. Morales. Uh, about the issue of um, detention of uh, children for migratory reasons, uh, this is a matter that uh, has been addressed by the uh, United Nations and uh, by regional bodies as well, and establishing that it's uh, prohibited under international law, were unaccompanied or with their families because of all the harm that this produced to children. And more generally, regarding the, the issue of the tension of migrants, and, and I want to address this issue as well, um, this has to be the, a measure of last resort. Uh, this has the potential of uh, bringing a more uh, sentiments of uh, xenophobia and racism among the population, because once you locked migrants based on migratory, on their migratory status, you are transmitting, either if you want it or, or, or you don't want, uh, you transmit the message to a population that uh, these, are, these persons are somehow criminals. And uh, so even when they might not be committed any crime according to domestic legislation, this has the effect of producing uh, further xenophobia among the population. Thank you. Before I close uh, the discussion, I've got a personal question for you, Mrs. Nicolini. You were uh, the emblematic figure, the symbol of uh, the defense uh, of the rights of migrants and in, in the uh, policy of uh, receiving uh, migrants in Lampedusa. You lost uh, your position as mayor. Tell me, what is the next step in uh, your political life? Well, I'm just taking a step back now. I'm uh, traveling around a lot. Oh, I'm here to begin with. Now, I don't uh, want uh, to renounce uh, political activity, and I want to continue the battle for things to change. And we want to get things to change as quickly as possible, because in the meantime, you've got children continuing to die. And we can't just uh, close our eyes and pretend nothing is happening. I think it is absolutely necessary that we manage, in the briefest amount of time, Uh, a center which uh, recognizes that there is a silent war going on in the Mediterranean, because that is the situation we're in. We're in a situation of war. I don't know what my activity will be in the future. It may be that I will uh, continue uh, to be active in the political field, but I will continue to work uh, in my uh, humanitarian activities. I feel that I have a responsibility there. They didn't want me to continue as mayor in Lampedusa. But uh, I don't want to throw all that I've done, uh, I don't want to throw overboard uh, all uh, that we have achieved. And uh, all the people who've come through have given me these uh, marks of esteem, of gratitude, of thanks. And I think it is a duty for me to continue to do this work. Well, I'd like uh, to thank uh, you on behalf of the uh, Geneva University and uh, thank you for having uh, borne witness. 
I think that this is important because they tie in with the objectives of the university to remind people what are the challenges uh, of uh, the world to today, particularly things that affect uh, our values and also the way we welcome uh, immigrants. Mrs. Uh, Nicolini, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. You are welcome uh, to the benches and uh, onto the... Uh, <laughs> Um, also onto the stage of uh, Geneva University. And Mr. Morales, also thank you very much for your analysis uh, from the perspective of the UNHCR. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And we hope that you will come back uh, to other events organized within the framework of the Week of Human Rights.